Hello, and welcome to Relative Pitch, a podcast about music, culture, and society from a young perspective. Our initiative is to bring fresh new ideas to the music field. Here are your hosts, Lauren Green, Anthony Morris, and Michael Brown. Hello, everyone. I just want to say um, I hope that you enjoyed our last episode of Bognerism episode. Uh, We really enjoyed filming it, and we really hope that you enjoyed listening to it. Um, Don't forget to please uh, join in on the conversation. Please get in with us. Give us all types of different topics. Um, Today, we have a very special episode for you. Um, We are joined uh, by Dr. Cynthia Johnson-Turner of UGA. Um, We all love her so, so, so much. So welcome, Dr. Turner. And please just give us a little background about your musical journey until honestly right now. Well, let me start by saying uh, happy, happy, sunny Sunday. At least that's where where I am in Georgia. And um, it's a great honor to be here. So thank, so thank you. I'm looking forward to this conversation very much. Um, my musical journey, I mean, how far back do you want to go? When I got my first, when I played, you know, like recorder or when I got my first little MIDI or it wasn't really a MIDI, this little wee electronic keyboard when I was nine. Like I, we could go back there because that actually tells a story. We were we were um, not a wealthy family, mm-hmm. and so I my best friend had a had an upright piano in her house, and she practiced all the time. And I every I you know I'd go home, mom, I really want a piano. Can you get me a piano? And it, it's I could tell that they wanted to do that, but they just didn't have the money. So one Christmas I got this. I think it was an octave and a half. <laughs> little olive green keyboard. I think it was probably the first ever, you know, electronic keyboard, you know, (laughs) ever. (laughs) Because it was pretty basic. And man, I was joined at the hip with that thing. You could not pry me away from it. So that's, that's how it all started is this pathetic little thing that turned out to be you know, the, the seed or at least the germ of an idea for me, an artistic idea. Um, yeah, I played recorder and ukulele like every other little Canadian kid. And um, then then I went into grade seven and met Mr. Brond, who was um, so handsome. <laughs> and, and, and he knew a lot about music. And uh, anyway, that was when I started the clarinet and then that was great. And he enrolled me into grade 10 music when I went to high school, which was a jazz band. So I picked up the saxophone. Uh, that was, those were my people, you know, that was my community, the band, the band room and the jazz band room. And uh, funny story, my, I was dating the first trumpet player in the jazz band, Cody Ford. Um, uh, when I was in grade 10 and he was in grade 12. And then that's how my then divorced mom met my band director and became shortly after my stepfather. So that's probably a whole year of therapy that I have not actually, you know, worked through. But yeah, we were the talk of the town, Peterborough, Ontario, because Cody and I kept dating. (laughs) And we moved all moved in together. It was just not right. (laughs) Anyway, Cody and I are, you know, now great friends and and brother sister and yeah so that's that that's that that maybe gives you a little insight into that's why she's so weird and then um yeah then i went to queens university in kingston we were talking about snow earlier Mm, you want snow you go to kingston ontario Mm. um yeah and i i did a, a bachelor of music and performance and then in education then i went to switzerland because I didn't want to settle down in Canada. And I wanted more snow, Michael, so let's go to Switzerland. Um, back before the internet, y'all, there was these things called letter writing. And so I wrote out 100 letters, photocopied them, sent them out snail mail to all over the world. Got three offers, Papua New Guinea, Japan, Switzerland. I took Switzerland because I could teach choral music. The other two were English as a second language. And um, they said they would pick me up at the airport in a limousine. And I went, yes, I'm going to Switzerland. (laughs) Because remember, we didn't come from a lot of money. Um, And so, um, yeah, that was an amazing year. Um, I learned a lot, taught computers in French. That was 
it's crazy. Uh, learned how to ski, of course. Um, came back, taught beginning band. Then I got my dream job, which is the job I would never leave, and that was a high school music teacher. Uh, then I left that job <laughs> 10 years later to do my master's uh, at the University of Victoria, way out in British Columbia on the West Coast. That was it. Uh, then I found out how much I did not know, like about music and conducting and leadership and everything, the world, uh, education, students, pedagogy, whatever. So and then I started to think, well, maybe I could do a doctorate. Nah, not smart enough, not good enough, not talented enough, the whole imposter syndrome, which I still suffer from. And um, long story short, I ended up at Eastman. Started as a PhD in music ed, followed Don Hunsberger around like a puppy till he finally just kind of shook me off and said, uh, do you want to conduct something? I said, okay. Uh, and it was uh, Al Fresco by Karel Husa, who was in the audience. I have no idea how it went because I was so nervous that I couldn't hear a thing. Uh, but it must have gone all right because Karel was happy and Don said, uh, you should be a conductor. So I switched from PhD to DMA, got the job at Cornell. Never thought I'd leave that job. Left that job, uh, and now I'm at the um, University of Georgia. Go dogs! Go dogs! Um, but first of all, your musical journey has—I know—it's been like everywhere, everywhere. Um, well, first thing, I have a question which is not even written down. How was your education in Canada? Because I mean, everyone, I mean, we are all US people and now you've kind of seen both ways. Like how, what are some of the similarities and and the differences between Canada and US? I know I've always wanted to know this, but like, I never knew who to ask. So what would you say the biggest similarities and differences? <laughs> well, okay, here I am. <laughs> I always want to know it. Here I am. That's great. Go. I'm glad I could fulfill this dream for you, <laughs> Anthony. Music education in Canada. Well, like the states, it's, you know, province by province, for, you know, and state by state. So Ontario, where I grew up, um, and again, school by school, district by district, I started a, a, a quote unquote band instrument in grade seven. When I um, became a high school music teacher, some of the grade nine students coming in were beginners. Some had had a real badass, you know, middle school um, program and they started in grade seven. So it was a real mix. Band and football is not a thing in Canada. And you can imagine why, right? And so the whole economy of band and the uh, marching band culture does not exist in Canada. And Canada is also one of the colonies, you know, so we're really, really rather rather married to the rather married to the crown. We still really, you know, that's those are our roots. So it's a the band that, that I was in in high school and the band that the bands that I um, perpetuated and conducted when I was a high school teacher were before school and after school. Classes are more comprehensive musicianship. Generally speaking, now that's not the case province to province, but that's that's generally speaking how it is. So I think it's changed now where we've been able to get band classes happening in multiple grade levels in one class so that you could have, you know, you know, your win ensemble, your spun band, whatever. But it's a very different culture of band in, in Canada. Um, some really good ones, but not nearly, not nearly as many as there are in the States. Well, there's just not as many anything in Canada as there is in the States. Right. So with it being Women's uh, History Month right now, go women, we love women. Um, I just want to ask you about your personal journey as a woman, especially like coming into this field that is like just male dominated and finding your way to a position like the one that you're at. Like, how how was that? What was your experience? What did you have to over overcome? And like, what what advice could you give for uh, young and upcoming female conductors. Yeah, this is, a, you know, even 10 years ago, Lauren, I would have said next question, you know, as far as I know, uh, conducting and, and teaching, you don't need, uh, you know, penis. <laughs> Ooh, I said penis on a podcast. 
Um, but but I but I now believe that y yes, this is a real issue, and it was an issue that I that I chose to ignore. Um, and I'm just going to put my head down and be you know 150 percent better than everybody else and uh, get out of my way. Right? This is that was my mentality. Also, I will say that there are probably an equal number, if not more, college band directors who identify as female in Canada than there are in the United States. So it's not a male dominated field in Canada, including high school um, band, orchestra and choir. <clears throat> so I really didn't feel the things that you're talking about until I came to the States. And then it was like, oh, okay, this is weird. CBDNA conference, right? Never a lineup for the women's bathroom. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, there are perks, I guess. Uh, but, you know, I remember certain instances while at Eastman, um, also in Europe, when I went to guest conducting in Salzburg. Wow, that is, that talk about tradition. Um, and, you know, little things when I'll go guest conducting somewhere. Um, I do, there's never anything, and you, you, you all get this, there's never anything, well, sometimes there are things you can put your finger on, but it's mostly just like feelings of, of, did that just happen? Did he just say that? Um, I don't know how to respond to that because this just feels awkward. Um, and I... I, I now kind of call out the bullshit when I see it, and that's my privilege, right, of, of, of a tenured professor uh, and all that. But, um, you know, just recently somebody said, um, we want to have a female, we haven't had a female conductor for our state honor band, I'll leave the state out of it, um, in, a, in a long time, and we want, we want our young girls to see a woman on the podium. And uh, okay, um, hopefully your young boys will also have a good time, you know? <laughs> what does this even mean? Um, so people try, I mean, there was just this, don't let me, don't, let's talk about the bassoon guy at Texas before the end of this podcast. But, but I mean, um, I feel like I have come to a place where I believe most people are trying um, they, they may not understand, they may, they may have grown up in a culture where they just say the stupidest things and they don't even know it, but I want to come from a place now where, yeah, I'm going to call out your bullshit, um, when I see it, but I, I want to do it from a place of empathy. And I actually learned that when I went through the long, a long talk, which is some anti-racism training that I've recently gone through and they taught me how to be not so passive aggressive. <laughs> With people who are like, mm -hmm, you uh, you have so much to learn, and you know I'm not perfect, right? I I, I have so much to learn, but um, I I really right now I feel like at Cornell when I was director of wind ensembles, and now at Georgia where where I'm the director of bands, and Jackie Hartenberger, who's a you know a gay woman, is the associate director of bands. I mean it's just not a it's just not an issue, uh, and I've I've. I'm either not paying that close attention, or at least with me, uh, it, it feels better, or I'm not accepting it. In terms of advice, it's true. You do have to be um, probably twice as good as your male counterparts. Um, because as, as much as we are all learning about our implicit biases and we are taking the sensitivity training and, you know, all, we're all learning about this stuff. Well, not all of us, right? There's a whole section of the society who's going, you know, not for me. Um, those are the people, you know, don't waste your bullets on the dumb. That's something I learned in the, in the long talk. Um, and go to the people who are, who want to learn. Um, yeah, I, I just want to do it from a place of empathy. But, and, and being a, being an educator is, is a, also an immense privilege to be able to call it out when I see it in a, in an empathetic way as well. Um, advice. Yeah. You just gotta be awesome. Um, but I feel like I didn't call it out when I was younger. Um, and, and I should have done. And I think that things 
And the reason I didn't is because I was afraid of, oh, I'm going to be the angry feminist bitch. Uh, I'm not going to get the job. Um, I'm not going to get the grade. Um, I'm not going to get the reference. Uh, you, you, you name it. Um, I'm not going to, you know, get to the second interview, what, whatever. Um, now, my advice is, as much as possible, call it out because you don't want to work there anyway, or you don't, you know, or you don't want to be in that environment anyway. Um, and, and things are better. They are. They're not nearly where they need to be, but they are better. And there are systemic, yes, there are systemic barriers to change. Yes, there are systemic issues, of course, but there are also systems that you can go through to, to get help, depending on where you are. That was a long answer. It's very complicated. Um, but yeah, you start looking at the stats in this country for, you know, women in, in leadership, whether, you know, across the board, you know, uh, not just, not just college band directing, uh, how many women are the middle school band director and their, and their husbands are the high school band director. You know, that's just, that's so extraordinary to me all through the States. Um, I think, uh, I, I mean, this is going to get weird maybe, but I think the other thing that's different to go back to Anthony's question about Canada and the United States, generally speaking, we're not so competitive in Canada. And I really feel like, like we're just nice, you know, you know, you, you, you we're nice and we're funny, right? It's Canadians. And so, uh, I feel like that whole trophy, uh, competition thing contributes to a masculine win at all costs environment. That's, that's, I guess that's controversial to say, but I'm going to say it because I, I, I feel like some women just don't identify with that. Um, and, and that might be why they're not attracted to, they don't have the representation. They haven't seen a female in that role or person that identifies as female. Um, and they're not attracted to the hyper competitive, um, band culture that exists in a lot of places. I, I totally agree. And especially some of the things that you were, you were just saying, uh, definitely relates to um, some of us as Black musicians as well. And last month, that was what we talked about a lot. Um, we had Dr. William Lake, Dr. R.S. Golden, um, and they talked about all of that. And a lot of things that you just said, some of it really just aligns, especially the representation. Um, it's, when you said, did they just say that? How am I supposed to respond to this? That I think we we really talked about that a lot. And just hearing you talk about it is is quite a big thing. And one thing that I I've, I've listened to you uh, from um, um, Janfest, and one thing that you said is you are changing how you were taught, the way you were taught to teach band. Um, you've learned throughout the years that nowadays you cannot teach like that. It is different. Um, and I wanted to see if you can expound upon that because when you said that, I wrote it down in my notes, like that is so right. The old school, and we actually had one of our viewers sent a message and said, can you talk about the old school way of band directing in the new school, like the differences and all that stuff. And I was like, I'm going to ask this today. Um, of how to really unlearn what you've been taught and teach something new. Mm. Yeah, we keep inbreeding ourselves too, right? I mean, uh, you, you're in terms of we we just sort of keep creating versions of ourselves in the band world and and probably lots of different cultures and and, and worlds and that we we just do what we've done. This is why change is so hard in higher ed, right? Um, uh, it changes hard everywhere, but we don't teach like we've been taught to teach. So some of the, some of the, um, pedagogy and, and approaches and all of that, that I learned in my bachelor of education, um, I, I mean, I didn't even go there when I got into my first, my first job. I, I went to, uh, well, this is how I was taught. I mean, it's almost like th that's how you were trained 
maybe that's a better way of saying it. You're not, you're not, you, you the difference between education and training, training is very, very powerful. <laughs> education is cool, but training is very powerful. And so it takes a, it takes a while to untrain yourself. At least it did for me to untrain those bad habits. And it took, a, it just, I mean, Look, I mean, I, I, I had a really good band program. It was one of the best in Ontario. Um, but I heard a lot of kids getting there. And I excluded a lot of kids getting there. And that's because I taught like I was taught. Um, I, I could be intimidating. I, I could do the band director stare. I had that down. Uh, you know, it, it, that's just, just how it was. And four or five years in, um, I finally had a kid teach me because we had this event outside with the jazz band and the whole rhythm section didn't show up for the gig. And well, it wasn't a gig, it was just this park thing that we were doing. And, you know, I, I sort of found them the next day and said, what's going on? They said, well, we actually, um, we did that on purpose. Um, we just, we just don't want to be part of this anymore. Boom. Um, that was very, very hurtful, um, but boy, they, t they taught me a great deal. And that, that was sort of a turning point for me is, so, okay, uh, these are good kids. These are smart kids. These are good musicians. What have I done to push them out of what I think is a, is a good program? Um, and so I just started to, you know, one of the many pedagogical crises I've had in my career um, I just sort of changed my ways, became more empathetic, uh, got rid of the fear-based kind of teaching. Uh, and I didn't do it overnight. Um, it, it, it took years. Um, and I think the band culture, generally speaking, has revered certain types of programs um, and certain types of teaching and certain types of conducting. Um, and we put these folks on the pedestal, just like Beethoven, right? The problem with genius, it's a problem. Um, and it wasn't until I read Randall Alsep and Kathy Benedict's, uh, article in 2008 called the problems with band, check it out. Um, and I just sort of read through this and they named names <laughs> who, who are the people we revere. Right. And, and I went, yes. This is what has been troubling me for so long about what we do. We stand on a box, literally with a stick, and tell them what to do, when to do, and how to do it. And then we call them more engaged students than the math class? I don't think so. I'm sorry. It's just not true. These music advocacy folks that saying what we do in the music band room is different? Really? Not in my band room for many, many years. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, that's when I sort of, this is now I'm at Cornell and I was also doing the Google Glass thing, which got me, you know, I was projecting the score and by projecting the score and giving all the students the big picture, I was relinquishing, well, wait a second, why am I the only one with all the information? This is ridiculous. Here it is, you know? And they became more engaged. Oh, gosh, look, the trumpets are the same thing as this. And yeah, no, I don't have to play forte because it's, you know, all those things. Way more engaged. Um, so I feel like now I ask a lot more questions. Um, I, I do a lot less conducting and more walking around the room. Um, I try to engage the musicians in the process as much as I possibly can. And I've gone even deeper this year. Um, the the uh what can i say the, the trying to be innovative through disruption let's put it that way um with the win ensemble at georgia it was like okay we we did we went virtual all in the fall we didn't do any in-person um, rehearsals and i said okay i want every student to say in that win ensemble that they're a composer i want every student to say in there that they are a teacher these all these you know, uh, masters and doctorates in, in DMA performance, right? So we did projects and, and, um, I, and, and, um, yeah, pr projects and assignments and fun stuff, uh, that, that they said that at the end of, at the end of the term, which is really great.
Um, and now I'm doing this thing called CCE, which is uh, right now CCE stands for Coerced Creative Experience, <laughs> where, where anybody that signs up for CCE, which is normally Contemporary Chamber Ensemble, right? But we're playing with the label. Um, that's, a, you know, the composers, performers, spoken word artists, whatever, and whoever shows up, that's our ensemble. And we're going to make it work. And the composers are going to compose for who's there. And it's going to be collaborative. It's it's very, very exciting. Yeah. So, I mean, that, it's, it's, yeah, that's just a little bit of it. That is all. And just, like, why you've been talking, I've been, like, taking mental notes, thinking about it, making me think about stuff. But this brings us to the first time, like, I met you. So I was a student at the UGA Music Institute, I believe the first summer you were at UGA. <laughs> and you did a demonstration of Google Glasses, I think, because you told us as students, I want to eliminate stands. And I want there to be no barriers between me, the podium and the musicians. I want to just all be in our glasses. And I was like, oh my God. Then I do some more things. And then I see you at Midwest. I'm like, oh my God. And then now you're on our podcast. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a journey. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we didn't get there. We haven't got there, right? With Google, Google Glass. Mm -hmm. um, all of the things that we envisioned with that, you know, you could see, see through the glass, the, the score is projected through the glass to the musicians, vice versa. We can make this happen. Well, it turns out that that's just not the case, right? Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I'm still very interested. Well, I think we know why this hasn't happened, but I, I didn't, we moved from Google Glass to the iPad and, mm -hmm. but I don't want an iPad on a music stand. I want my music stand to be an iPad. Like, where is that? Where is this large podium or small stand that's actually the iPad and now the musicians have it right now you can of course you can play from the iPad so this is uh, we're talking about seven years ago now Michael mm -hmm. um, we're slowly getting there we're slowly getting there um, and yeah I mean there's still I think there's still something to be said for you know for, for this as many trees as we cut down um, there's still something to be said for paper and I, I think it's going to take a generation for that to change. My mm -hmm. husband my husband said he would never ever stop getting the New York Times delivered, you know. This huge paper. And now you know, I just said to him the other day, you know, it's been about 3 years that you've been reading off the laptop. I know, he said it's so weird. So, you know, I think that I think the day is coming. Mm -hmm. Um and I think also the problem with music stands, like it's, you go to an orchestra or a band concert, or even a choir concert, and we're still reading music, right? There's still, people come to our concerts and we're sitting there reading music. They go to a play or a musical or anything else, there's no music stands and music there, right? It's so fascinating to me that, we, that we're still doing this. I mean, and don't tell me the music's more complicated. Give me a break. Uh, have you been to an opera? <laughs> You, you know, where they're, you know, they're, they don't have their music in front of them. I mean, the orchestra does, but not, not the singers. So I think we're at this really interesting time when, um, when, when maybe sheet music will become entirely digitized, uh, or it'll just go away and it'll, it'll go away, period. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, the reason I'm saying that part is because I've, I've had some very interesting conversations lately with hip hop artists who do not use music, right? They don't, they don't use notated mm -hmm. music. There are, uh, the majority of musicians don't use notated music. It's just we classically trained, not classically educated, classically trained musicians are stuck to the page, right? Yep. Most of us. And how most Hip hop, well, all hip hop artists that I that I that I know, and I don't know all of them, but but most pop musicians are are here, right? They learn with their they learn with their ears. I wish I had their ears. Me too. Me, yeah. me too. Anthony can tell you that that is 
yeah, I wish I had like a lot of people's ears. Yeah. <laughs> except. <for me. laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a, a weird way to get to your question, Michael, but yeah, the, the whole, I, I think muse technology can enhance music and pedagogy and learning. Um, and, and you, yeah, you can be afraid of it, but I mean, the first time we picked up a rock, we could use it to build something or as a tool, or we could knock somebody on the head, right? There's always been this problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, oh, well, technology, you know? So um, I think that anything that makes students' lives better or, or you can address different learning styles, we're not very good at that in the band room either, right? There's only one learning style that, you know, everybody else has been doing this for many years now, but we're still, we tend to teach the same way. Um, so if we can use technology to help other students learn, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's cool too. That's so cool. And like Michael brought up, you know, Jan Fest and we've been talking about it for a little bit. I wasn't, you know, able to do Jan Fest when I was a young lad, uh, which is unfortunate because I wish I did. But I wanted to ask you, like, you know, youth ensembles, youth symphonies were so important for me in my development as a musician. What's your favorite part about hosting Jan Fest at UGA? Oh, the, uh, I love Jan Fest. Um, you know, it's exhausting um, and it's a little smelly, <laughs> um, I, it, it, but it's just the energy is palpable. Um, and I love that sense of community that we can establish in three days. Um, I think probably my favorite part, though, if I had to, if I had to choose, and you're making me choose because you asked the question, is is the is the concert that the Hudson Wind Ensemble puts on for our audience. First of all, there's over a thousand um, people in the audience, and they love band, um, and they're there to have a good time, and so that energy is really cool, and we don't normally have it, right? I love watching my students. And this is the DMAs in tuba performance to the music education majors in the group. They they look around at all the people in the audience and they feel the energy and they're hearing the woo woo and the you know whatever, um, uh, and they they're like they love it right. Um, and lately we've been doing things differently where it's more of a collage concert and we're we're um, amplifying other ensembles in the school of music, not just the the quote unquote premier ensembles. Um, and we're just trying to be a little bit more inclusive there. And that's been really popular. And yeah, last year, well, not last, this past year was virtual, but two years ago, well, we do a lot of things to break down these ridiculous repressed, uh, repressive rules that we have for quote unquote classical music. So one of them is that we've been doing for, for many years now is inviting people on the stage. So, um, just for the last piece or whatever you just we've got a lot of extra chairs there or if you want to stand come on up and and for the last piece you're on the stage with the musicians wherever you want to be um and i said that at jan fest you know anybody that wants to come on the stage like, <laughs> hundreds of kids rushed the stage it was awesome right that person was like holy shit. you know this how, how are we gonna handle this right but uh, the other part of me was like yes this is a band concert and they're rushing the stage. <laughs> they're, they're into it. So that, you know, I, maybe that's my favorite part right now, looking back because of COVID and we haven't been in, in, in real life, real time in person for, for a while, but um, just generally speaking, the energy, the growth and the community is, um, you know, it just keeps to getting better and better too. I get, you know, all of the amazing guest clinicians that we have and, yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we're there next year. Yeah, and it's funny because us three, we were on our way to Jan Fest uh, two years ago when it, the last one that was in person. But coming from Kennesaw, we got to 85 and we saw how bad that traffic was. We were like, okay, we're going to watch this virtually. So we turned back around, we got something to eat, and we watched it at our at our apartment on the big screen just watching Jan Fest. And we really wanted to, we thought we were going to be there. Like we had planned everything. 
but traffic said no. You know how ridiculous Atlanta traffic can be. So definitely. Yeah. Well, so the, so in that case, you were way ahead of your time. Like you, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, we can do this virtually, and and I can be eating, have a glass of wine, and have my slippers on. So there's That's something true. about that. And we still felt the yeah. same amount of just love and just love for music, um, even through miles away through a, a TV. So it was a great, great, great thing. Um, one thing that just- Yeah, I mean, the other cool, uh, just to, one more thing, the other cool thing about it as, as band directors and, and parents that walk around from clinic to clinic or rehearsal to rehearsal, you can pick up some really great tips, Absolutely. really great rehearsal techniques. And I mean, all, all my best rehearsal techniques are stolen, right? I mean, it's just yeah. how I, I, I it is um, oh. from 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 other people and sort of make them mine. But that's the other cool part about Jan Fest and Mid Fest is just walking around and seeing these how people rehearse and the level of engagement or lack thereof and what's working and what isn't. Great tips. Yeah, and it, it is so. I can't wait to actually go to one. Hopefully next year or the year after, whenever. Um, but something that piqued my interest is your work with hip hop artists. Um, and especially in quote unquote classical music, it is not heard of very much. And um, we were talking about uh, our first Black History Month was about gospel and jazz. And when you said they don't have music, I mean, I was raised in a gospel church. We did everything by ear. We played everything by ear. And that's exactly what I thought was music for a long time until we got classically trained and then we're like, oh my gosh. So what inspired your work with hip hop artists and in getting into that genre of music, especially as a classically trained musician? Yeah, first of all, that all that stuff that you said before you said, I thought this was music, it, it was. <laughs> And, 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 you know, and, and there's an argument to be, I don't want to get into comparisons. There's a both and here, right? But there's not one that's better than the other. Uh, classically trained musicians have thought that their, their, their music, music making and, and, and uh, uh, hierarchy and history was more quality, more important, more gravitas. Uh, more for the soul, said somebody at San Francisco Opera that I called out, said, you know, opera's for the soul and pop music's for the body, excuse me. Um, so, you know, these weird comparisons that way. So um, the hip hop project, it means, I don't, you, you probably know this, but Athens, Georgia is got one of the hippest, you know, well, I don't even like this term anymore, alternative music scenes, alternative to what? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, um, it's got an awesome music scene that happens in the bars. Well, let me put it that way, um, where most people go and we're trying to get, you know, 100 people to come to our orchestra and band concerts. Let me put it that way. So there's an amazing music scene in Athens, Georgia, downtown. Um, and the music scene that, that most people have heard about is REM, B-52s, Drive-By Truckers. Well, there's a whole amazing hip hop scene that's that's starting to get some attention, right? Some national attention. We can imagine why it didn't get attention uh, 10 years ago when it was still is happening, right? But now it is getting attention. So let's move forward. Connie Frigo, who teaches saxophone at the University of Georgia, when she found out that we were hosting CBDNA, which got COVID postponed, um, she emailed me one day, we're very good friends, she's awesome, creative, so artistically curious, uh, I, I think she's incredible. She emailed and said, what's, what's not happening in the wind ensemble world that, that could be happening for CBDNA? And I said, girl, let's go get a bottle of wine. And, and, and we came to um, the hip hop scene in Athens and what would it, what would it, look like what would it sound like what would it feel like if our um faculty composers co-composed music with hip-hop artists for wind ensemble what would that what would that experience be like and um that's that was our question and so we went to the the faculty composers and they're like right on 
Uh, we went to some hip hop artists that we'd already had some conversations with, Mariah Parker, AKA uh, Lingua Franca. Uh, Montu Miller is a hip hop producer in, in um, Athens who's amazing. I said, what do you think? Oh, and, and, and uh, uh, we, had, we had already done some work with Athens anti-discrimination group. So we met with those folks. What do you think about this for an idea of, you know, just like real creative placemaking and community engagement? You know, real community engagement, not like I'm going to go to you and play a concert and then leave again. That's not community engagement. Uh, the community engagement where you you're interested in learning from the community, right? Um, and they're like, yeah, great. And so we had our first meeting, and um, it was incredible. So uh, we basically, long story short, right, what's happening right now, or what was happening pre-COVID, was. Um, hip hop artists were pairing up with some of our faculty composers whose music we shared each other's music and went, yeah, that's great. I, yeah, let's get together. Let's get into each other's sandboxes and go. And so, uh, Peter Lane and, and Lingua Franca have been doing some stuff. Um, Caulfield and Emily Co started to do some stuff. Um, there's this kid named, well, he's not a kid anymore. King Blanco, B L X. NCO, or is it KX? Yeah, K, pardon me, KXNG Blanco. He's getting a lot of attention now. He was the kid at that one of the first meetings when we were talking about artistic process that said to me, I have a question. What's a Pops concert? I, you know, I, I sort of was like, that's a really good question, Kay. Like I'll never forget it. I went, it's it's the concert where we play the music that people really want to hear. Now wait a second. It's the con you know, it's like, oh, this is a great question, right? It's so profound for classically trained musicians, right? It's a pops concert. They don't think that way. Um anyway, right now with the CCE, we're doing a something with uh Honeysuckle Brown, who's a spoken word artist. Um Tafara Brown, and um, she she put out a book of poetry called Honeysuckle, which is about her experience. Check her out; she's incredible. And she, we're we're kind of collaborating with her right now, and I think she's going to be a big part of this project too. I don't know what the product's going to be at this point. It's like who cares? Because the process has been incredible, you know. And and our and our students are well, were and will get out of the bubble that is UGA, right? Um, you walk around the campus of the University of Georgia and you wouldn't know that Athens sits in one of the poorest counties in Georgia, right? So that disconnect has, is a problem for me. And, and uh, let's, you know, there's, there's folks being invited campus to campus who weren't, didn't feel welcome before. Uh, anyway, we're leaving campus and going to them because it's cooler. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I mean, that I'm so glad um, for that. And that brings us to one of our questions that we talked about before um, your prison concert. Uh, when I first heard about that, I was like, that is an amazing idea. Where, for, number one, where did that all come from? Like, I, I don't know too many band directors or any types of directors. Like, let's go perform in a prison. Where did that really come from? Yeah, it was, wasn't my idea. Um, I heard about it and went, this is this this is the work right here. This is good. Um, I, I'm just forgetting his name right now. He's out in California. He gave a presentation uh, at CBDNA 20. I'm in, I don't know. I don't know what year. I didn't, I couldn't go. Um, but one of my grad students, Jonathan Poquette, came back and said this. And I went, yes. Um, and so, uh, I, he said he went, he had gone to the, 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 the talk at CBDNA and he found it very moving and, you know, he sort of said Cindy would be all over this and, and then he came back and, you know, there are over 30 state prisons in Georgia. Uh, and, uh, it was just sort of another, okay, um, maybe we could go and spread a little love and a little joy um, and grace, um, to, 
to these folks. We know that generally speaking, um, the majority of people in state prisons are black and they're in, a lot of them are in there for smoke and weed. Um, you start looking at the stats of some of this stuff and it's just, all right, um, you yeah, know, we've all seen the documentary 13th and, and you know, and so, uh, it was a way for, on one level, like, let's just go and share music to a population that wouldn't necessarily be, um, exposed to the kind of music that we are, are doing. Um, on another level, it was about joy and beauty and grace. And on another level, it was about, um, second chances, third chances, and it was also helping my students understand um, just to get out of the bubble. Um, and we, so we went to two prisons. One was a medium security men's facility um, where we were able to interact with, with the audience, um, not just musically. And we, you know, they, they were looking at the contrabassoon and, and nib, uh, McKinney, who was playing contrabassoon, she was all over it. She stood up and she said, you want a demo? And, you know, it was like a demo. And they were like, oh, this is fantastic. And, um, and then we were able to sort of mingle with them after. That's where we played Omar Thomas's Mother of a Revolution. And a, yeah, and a young man came up to me and said, thank you for playing that piece. You have no idea how hard it is to be gay in here. Um, and um, the other place was a maximum security uh, women's facility that was a little more hardcore in the sense that we couldn't act we couldn't interact with the with the audience they were pretty they were a, a long distance away but they had a great time and we had a great time um, and I want to do that again I'm thinking maybe something more sustainable could we could we teach music I mean Cornell has a, a, an incredibly robust to use a veep word I don't know if you're veep fans a ro ro prison education program where you can get a Cornell degree um, in, in some of the prisons in New York, and maybe we could do something like that at Georgia. That that is a great program. I remember first hearing about like music entering prisons uh, from a master class by Joyce Didonato. Mm. He does this, and one of the people, because she often goes to the same prison, one of the people was like, "I'm going to write an opera for you, like centered around you," because they were that inspired. And I feel like. I didn't know there was that many prisons in Georgia, first of all. Second of all, it's they're locked away. And a lot of people kind of forget about them as like I did because I didn't know there was that many prisons. They're locked away in these places. And it, I think that's a good program that you can like bring music to them because they're still people. At the end of the day, you're still people. And half of them, like you should not be, it's legal up here. You can smoke weed. Screw it. It's just weed. Like, you know what I mean? But I was going to ask you, change the pace a little bit. You're a college band director. You have JanFest. You see MidFest. What do you see the talent level of young musicians? Is it growing over time since you, like, started the profession as a band director? And now that you're in the States compared to Canada, like, what is that? What are young musicians looking like nowadays? And how are they, like, getting better or more curious than old? I don't know. That's a very interesting question. I think it depends on your metric, right? I mean, I think, by the way, I want, I want somebody, to, if you could fact check the how many prisons are in Georgia. It's either 22 or close to 30. So fact check that for me. There's a lot, <laughs> more, than you, more than you would think. Um, yeah, depending on your metric. I mean, if, you, if our metric is our, our students in getting better at band instruments and orchestra instruments and singing, then I think so. Yeah. I think the teaching is getting better and better. Um, I, I think that, uh, over the course of the years that I've been in the system, so to speak, um, yeah, there's some, there's some pretty amazing people coming, coming up to, quote unquote to, to college. Although I'll never forget Don Hunsberger when I was doing, when I was doing my doctorate at Eastman, he came back. Um, after a year he retired and he went and he, and he was conducting the wind ensemble and he left and he said, these kids today can't play. I said, well, <laughs> um, so I think it depends on the metric, who you're talking mm -hmm. to. I mean, I, I feel like, um, 
there are a lot more students out there that can work a MIDI controller than before. I can't figure that. I bought one um, just because, you know, hip hop and I was wanting to make some beats and like, you know, can I do this? And this is hard. You know, it's like I'm watching a lot of YouTube videos trying to figure this out. Well, there are lots, lots of people younger than me, younger than I am, who have figured this out, right? And so that's what I mean. It depends on your metric. There, mm-hmm. There's some incredibly talented MIDI controller folks out there that, that just blow my mind. Um, and I think it's state by state, country by country. I mean, um, you could argue that, well, it's going to get me in trouble, but you could argue that... Um, there are a lot of kids in Texas who can play the hell. They're beasts on their instruments, but I'm not sure how happy they are. And the reason I say that is is the competition thing that we were that we were yep. talking about earlier. But I'll, I I had this another moment when I was at Cornell. Um, a, a young woman came and auditioned on clarinet. A beast, just a beast. She was from uh, just outside Dallas. Um, and she she was in the wind ensemble for maybe two and a half years. No, that's not true. It was about a year. And she quit. And I said, what? You know, why, why did she, cause she said, she said, you know, Dr. T, it's not you. It's me. It's not you. It's me. Um, and she just said, I, I just got burned out in Texas. And it, I mean, it happens. Me and Anthony, I think we're talking about this yesterday about the whole like competitive band culture. I mean, we grew up in competitive marching band. Like your your mission was to go to these competitions where you could actually meet and mingle with other musicians your age, kind of like district or jam fest. But instead, you're like, I want to beat you. I want to win. And that's such a hard mindset to break. By the way, there's 34 prisons with almost 52,000 felony offenders. In them, if we want to put a number on that. So I just wanted to let you know about that. I believe Lauren has the next question. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, go back to TMEA because that was the first thing I wrote down whenever I knew we were going to be talking to you. I was like, we're going to talk about this. Um, and there's actually two different um, things that have come up in the past month or so that sparked a lot of ridicule memes, I'll have to say as well, uh, within the... The, the music community. So the first one, yeah, is that really tone deaf uh, bassoon, like building better bassoons uh, from the presentation, which I will, you know, describe for people who may not know exactly what it said, but um, it says how to choose the right student, of, assuming for bassoon, um, self-motivation, intelligence, socioeconomic status, prepackaged musical knowledge, and a stable home. Yo, what? <laughs> can we just like take, I can take a whole hour to unpack what is wrong with everything that they list. First of all, I have never, ever, ever in my life thought about things like this in terms of music. Right. Because I don't think about music that way. Because it's basically saying we need, we're, it's a factory. This is basically telling me that they're only seeing students as you know people who they're going to push out into the field like revenue wise and just competition wise and everything we just discussed um and this is obviously targeting a certain person a certain student and the fact that this was allowed to be presented i mean what what was your because i think i read it and i didn't think it was real at (laughs) first because it was so absurd um what was your reaction to this. Well, I put I put it on Facebook. Like, here's a fun game, <laughs> you know, like, like find the errors. Um, yeah, apparently I did look into it, um, and I did contact him because I didn't think it was fair to sort of put it on the socials. Like, it turned out everybody else did, with him, so that's okay. Without without co- contacting contacting him and to say. I'd love to chat with you about why you're being ridiculed right now. If you, if you're open to that, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and he didn't get back to me because Texas, uh, winter storm happened. Right. But he did finally get back to me, uh, to his credit. And he said, I really would like to talk with you about this. I've, a lot of people have reached out. I get it. I, I, I think I get it. I have a lot to learn. That was so awful. You know, and, and anyway, uh, we, we're still trying to hook up, but you know, it's, it's, it hasn't happened yet. 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, who is this guy? I mean, I, um, we did, you know, I talked to some bassoon colleagues and and students, and I'd never heard of him. So, uh, and and I also reached out to TMEA, who sent me an email, and they said we don't we check the the little blurb about what this is, but we don't check all the slides. Okay, um, now maybe you will, right? Uh, or or maybe you need to vet content in some other way that this this wouldn't happen and it didn't you know, wouldn't hurt a lot of people because this guy emailed to say, president say, this just doesn't represent TMEA. This doesn't represent a lot of the teachers in Texas and blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, well, um, what do you, what now? Right. Okay. You blew it. What, what now? What are you, what are you going to do? And I haven't heard anything. So, so anyway, I, yeah, I, we could spend an hour talk unpacking that and talking about everything that was wrong. Let's not, because you know, I think I think that your 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 listeners, um, you know, will probably also get it. What I find interesting, I mean, it's all interesting, is is, is that it did lead to outrage and dialogue and ridicule and memes, and that's that other kind of weird part of it. But lots of people having a conversation about why this was such a problem. You know, and that's good, right? Um, that you know, you started to follow some of the conversations. This isn't about race, says somebody, right? On on Facebook or Instagram, I don't know why. Why are you making this about race? Okay, uh, and so you know, the, yes, Facebook is a vacuum and an echo chamber and all that, but at, but at least there, that person was engaged with by other people say so let me tell you why it is about race you know the the thing that happened most recently with it is the apology right he um uh, he released a, an apology which if you read it um with an open heart and an open mind to me it's like this is a good apology some apologies are shit right some apologies are are uh, make excuses or defensive or I didn't know, or, you know, the, the, or, or performative, right? This to me was, yeah, okay. I think, I think, and I think because I had a conversation with him, at least by email that I felt like he was genuinely, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, that was a big leap from that slide to the apology. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, but what's happened on Facebook is that the apologies posted and now there's the debate of whether it's real or not. Did he write it? Did he mean it? Um, you know, and, and, and my sort of feeling, and maybe I'm wrong on this, is I feel like we have to acknowledge growth, even if it's not, even if it's just, you know, a little bit, or, or it's not enough growth by our standards or somebody's standards or somebody else's standards. At least it's, it moved forward, right? And isn't isn't that the point? I'm not saying you know that it was perfect. I'm I'm not saying that it was a massive mis like horrible hurtful mistake. Um, but I feel like sort of acknowledging the the movement forward is a is a way forward. Um, I don't know how y'all feel about that. I mean, because there's somebody that said no. Nope, no, nope, this is performative. I don't know. Nope, it's typed out. No, nope, he didn't read it. But like there was just like, no. And I'm, and I'm like, well, I, you know, I, so I don't know how you feel about it, but that's the, that's the latest thing that just happened today. Somebody replied to me and said, no, it strikes me as performative. I, I don't, I don't accept it. So it's like, okay, what am I, what am I missing? So I, I don't, I. Well, I think the reason why, uh, a lot of people see these blank statements of, I apologize for the thing I said two days ago, um, is because honestly, I am a person who I stand by my convictions. I was brought up a certain way and I'm not going to change overnight. I'm not going to change in a week. Um, now things can influence me that make me go, okay, I'm going to think about this in a different way, but I'm not just going to be a completely different person. Cause this, this, 
I would never say anything like this. I would never, this, like I said, something like this didn't even make sense in my mind. Therefore, you know, the idea of someone who could be able to think this way, just completely saying, oh yeah, my bad about it. I'm not saying it's performative. I'm not saying it didn't come from a genuine place. It's hard to believe because I am a person who I truly know who I am. And I would never say anything that I didn't truly believe in. And so no, in a month, even a month or two months, whatever, I'm not going to completely like be a different person unless it was something that just major and maybe this was something major for him that he's never experienced backlash or ridicule in this uh, shape before and i understand that during the summer of last summer 2020 when everything was happening with the george floyd protest and black lives matter i had like i started a thing of throughout the ksc school of music called black in the arts Okay, and it was a hashtag that was going around social media where I anonymously, anonymously, that's a word, um, talked about experiences of mine being at the School of Music and the ways I had been racially profiled, stereotyped in every situation that I had. I had people who recognized themselves in those statements from freshman year who reached out to me and said, I apologize for the part that I had to play in this because I know that was who I, who I was at that point. That is not who I am now. And I, for some of those people who are still my friends and still are my friends to this day, I knew they were coming from a different place because I saw past what happened and I knew they were a more genuine person and they, it was years, right? This is like freshman year. Now it was senior year. So I was like, I have seen by your actions that yes, you are a different person. There are some people though, who said, no, screw them still. I, I don't believe they changed them. That is absolutely your opinion. And I can't disagree with that because those are your feelings. For me, I feel like I can tell when someone's being truly genuine in my situation. That is the only thing is I can only speak for myself and the things that I have been through because I don't know how other things affect other people. And so I can't do a blanket thing saying everyone should be understanding of this situation. Like, no, I don't have to be understanding of any situation unless I understand it. Um, and it's hard. It's so hard. And I get really passionate about it because it's discussing these things, especially during these times, it's hard because you don't want to offend anyone. But at the same time, you want to be real and you want to be raw and you want to be genuine, but you want to be understanding of everyone who's involved in the situation, victim or the person who may have initiated it. Um, and so that was my take from it. It was I, I didn't really see the, I didn't see the, I will have to say I didn't see the apology. I don't know how I would have felt about it. But a lot of times there are statements that have come out from certain people that I'm like, I call BS immediately. I'm like, no, you're, someone wrote that for you. You don't actually sign your name to it, but you didn't really mean it. I don't know in this case if that was him. That's really helpful for me because I, I, I would love to your reaction to it. Um, and I think that one of the things that I found interesting is that I don't believe that when, when you know this doesn't represent the feelings of a lot of texas or band directors in general i don't believe that i i i believe it does <laughs> that you know in in order to have the the great players or the people that can buy buy or make the reads or take the private lessons or you know when this is a problem this is something i've come to ask myself lately who have i excluded who have we excluded by focusing so heavily on band orchestra and a certain way of singing in school? My whole career, who have I excluded? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that slide and his mentality of, you know, you need somebody with some cash, you know, you need somebody who can afford private lessons because it's a hard instrument, blah, blah, blah. I actually think that there's a lot of people that believe that. Oh, it is. Right. Oh, it is. And so that's why I think like he, he, after a lot of people spoke to him, he came to a place of, well, I don't, yeah, I don't know, Lauren. Now you've got me like, yeah. I know, I'm sorry. I just, it's a bastard. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like, yeah, I don't know. And, and, and I'm going to shut yeah. up and listen because that's how, that's how I, that's how I learn. Right. And, and I, yeah, I just, I, I feel like, okay. Um, that's my husband who now reads the New York times on his laptop. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I love this conversation because, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, how, I think I can't help but come from my place of privilege. It's just I can't help it. As much as I, um, as much as I'm learning and reading and listening and 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 trying to come from a place of humility, society has said for so my whole life that I, you know, I'm I'm white and therefore all the things, mm-hmm. all the things. And so maybe my reaction to his apology is, oh, okay, well, you know, um, maybe, the, you know, he's trying, right? So right. we, we got to give him that. And your reaction is, fuck no, that's not good enough. And, I, and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to listen now. And I think for us, especially being uh, Black students in music and especially since last, I think me and Laura, we had like a long conversation about this of last summer, we saw so many places give blanket statements saying that we support our black students. And we, but the thing is, we know from personal experiences that that is not the truth. Wasn't the case. I think that's where our mistrust, whenever we hear an apology uh, or a statement of any choice, we're like, "Mm, we want to see some more action behind this about that action that's been the whole thing it's like words are words we're about that action i want to see right. what it means when you say we're pushing for an inclusive environment we're pushing for mm-hmm. diversity we're pushing for equity what does that mean i don't care what you say it's like what i see you do after you make the mistake right. is what's important to me you know so it'll be interesting to see if what he does next right absolutely, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I, this was a big thing with Deeb, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Go, go to the Deeb website at, at, at music school. We have, we have our commitments and we have our dates. Like, mm-hmm. This is what we're going to do by this date. Because I, I feel, yeah, the School of Music put out a pretty good statement mm-hmm. in the summer. And then... Yeah, yeah. And it's not like anything, it's not like nothing was happening. There were things happening. We weren't communicating it, but, but right. yeah, this, the silence is, is something. The silence right? is strong. It is yeah. very strong. Yeah. yeah. And there's another, like the other one I wanted to bring up, which I think I sent it in the group chat to y'all, like a little bit last week was the, the Oberlin um, oh. thing that happened with the celebration of black artistry. Yes. I'm sorry, but. Brutal. I, so that's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and now their apology was terrible. Oh, because they didn't care. That's my thing. They yeah, didn't it's like, oh, care. but we are performing black. We are at our other concert. We did the. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, that was okay. There, there's, there's an example of a really shitty. Oh concert. my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was easy. Like who? I don't understand how you can make a poster like this and not like it burns up or your computer crashes. Like that may, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like nobody how? check it. I mean, I know before you post no. on social media, I, and that also brings to me, where are the black students that go to Oberlin? Because I'm pretty sure if they would have um, saw any of that, they would have said, wait a minute. You just saw Ohio. Like, Ooh, yeah, uh, honey, where oh, where oh, where are oh, the black I, students? <laughs> I mean, we, we met one of their alumni, but I was gonna say, and this piggybacking off of them too, like I, I had to be under Lauren and Anthony's wing from freshman year. I came from Hickville, Georgia, <laughs> with a nice thick accent, <laughs> and I had to learn. So, mm. like when I look, and I remember seeing all these blanket statements, mm. and my thing is knowing like who I am, my culture, the first thing they're gonna do is just throw a buttload of money toward it. That does not, not that's not gonna fix nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But throwing money fixes nothing. I mean throwing money makes this flyer with all the white people on it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's where I'm like action is I, I've really had to learn from Anthony and Lauren because they'll we'll send stuff in group chats and we'll send all the statements that were ever released. We have them all in our group chat. We're like so what was, are the people who waited so long to make a statement or the people who put it out immediately? And it was like, so the media, are you actually being real? The one who waited, you had to check all the boxes, make sure we're not going to make any of our donors mad. And at this point, and me and Anthony were talking about this yesterday, if you work somewhere where they don't want to be pushing forward in uh, social issues and all this, why do you want to work there? Because they 
believe in the same thing you do. Because me and Anthony were talking about a very specific situation of like, why would you work there if you are not enjoying your time or your life? Absolutely. Like money does not mean everything at the end of the day. You can't take it with you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah um, but yeah, yeah, the whole Oberlin thing was... R- I mean, it was almost like the next day, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. was it or within a week or something? It was like it was an oh, immediate no. like response. Like, yeah. then I saw a meme poster of it, and then I was. It was so funny. It was something like Joe uh, featuring like Joe Biden's dogs, and I was like, "What is this? <laughs> like, hilarious!" Yeah, but, yeah. Like how I the thing about it is I I don't think people were saying like oh like and no one other than black people can talk about so like the celebration of black artists is not what it's saying but at the same time you couldn't go find maybe like five black people at your school who could have done this thing no yeah i, I mean maybe not i don't maybe know not. I, 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 one, yeah one the problem <laughs> yeah that brings i mean that is a that is a huge sorry sorry anthony no, it's just bringing to our struggle. I remember me and Lauren, we, we, when we were in college, I think it was like our junior year, we went to Buffalo Wild Wings and we, we just sat there for two and a half hours just talking about is the, this university culture, the music university culture that we want our lives to be in, is it built for us? Are we accepted? Because when we see things like this, we really do feel that imposter syndrome very much. Like, do we even belong here? They can't even find five black students to be put on a poster. Where are they? Mm-hmm. And and it and it it bugs us. And to this day, we still have conversations. And that's really what fueled this podcast was to voice our opinions and then have Michael in there to really kind of give all types of voices to it. So it is a struggle that we live with every single day doing just normal things. It is a big struggle. It is a very big struggle. But we see people like you who is really championing like all of, you know, doing good things and doing the actual work that is necessary. And so that is why we were like, we really, really, really want to have you on here because of your work and your, your mentality. Of, I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to take this BS. I'm, this is what we're doing. And so we want to thank you so much for just doing the necessary work that we have. And I want to like add to that, like you, like you, like Michael are so important for the, what we're doing because like, yes, Michael, when, (laughs) when we became friends, he was a very different person. Okay. This is what I mean by I can see past things to know when someone's like, it's, is it their training? Is this, or is this something that's like truly within them? And I was like, no, this isn't who this person is. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, it was, it only took what a few crying sessions and a few right. other things like happened where he, morning, it was more than a few. Cause I would, I, I, I cry, I break down. Yeah. There was a lot. Yeah. And that's the whole point is and it, when you, when we were talking about the, the apology and you notice like my reaction to it, then you thought to yourself, Oh, wait a minute, maybe I should. That's so important because I do the same thing with situations where I may not find, Oh, I wasn't really offended by it. I have to think to myself, well, it doesn't matter if you were offended by it. This right. wasn't about you, you know? And that I, I think that's what's so important about pushing forward is not getting like, I, for myself have to think, all right, let me be selfless for a second and put myself in someone else's shoes and go, okay, yeah, I would feel a little bit different if I were in that situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference between a lot of people is that some people don't feel like they can't put that different hat on or change Mm -hmm. those shoes and think about other people, like empathy. It's Mm -hmm. truly empathy. And I think that's what, so it's so genuine about you and what we can see from you is that you genuinely want to know and want to be a part of the change. And you you're continuing to want to learn different perspectives and have like learn about other people's opinions to help, shape the way that you go about bringing change to your own ensembles and within your own work. So we are very appreciative for people like you and people like Michael who want to be a part of this change. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, that's, that's, that's um, humbling to hear. Yeah. I got a lot to learn. Right. I got a, I got I a lot to learn. Right. Still. Same. Yeah. I, you know, like- I mean, we've kind of come full circle with tr- training versus education and, mm-hmm. you know, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I did a lot of the implicit bias training that Harvard study. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, this is it's there's just so much. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's part of the divide is that a lot of white people who have all the power, it's, you know, basically, uh, what are you afraid of? You still got all the power. Um, I, I, I think that uh, they they see these things as absolute flaws, like that, that, that these things are either or versus having biases doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a person. Mm -hmm. And we're all on this spectrum of learning and, and, and growing and, and, and learning empathy and listening. And, and, you know, I, I think that that, that message isn't necessarily getting out there that just because you have these feelings, these bias, this, this background, like Michael had Hicks, Hicksville, Georgia, that you can't grow and change and, 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 um, and develop. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think that that's and evolve basically. And I think that that, that message needs to get out there to a lot more white people. I went back to Texas, but I was just sharing a story when I took what win methods, really in the same nutshell my professor said you want your students who have money to get private lessons put them on double reed instruments oboes bassoons you want somebody to be you know come from a uh well lifestyle that could you know foster this instrument as if that instrument was any harder than any other instrument in the world so when texas says oh we don't our teachers don't believe in this. Okay, but a lot of teachers who <laughs> don't believe in this. And to the teacher that taught me in college less than two years ago had yeah. the same mindset. So, it, and that's what frustrates me when I hear blanket statements and all this, cause I'm like- This does not represent who we are. Okay, but what if it no. does? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. ask yourself that question, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't think they, they have and they, they did because you know yeah you, that's that's how i was taught there's another example of we we don't you know you teach like you've been taught i mean um basically the variations on that theme was what i heard growing up mm -hmm. you know if you yeah. want a successful band program boom 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 oh exactly yeah. okay. and I, one thing that just got brought up in our conversations we, a couple of us master students went out to coffee and we were talking about band dues. And I don't know about Lauren and Anthony growing up. I All I had to pay for the whole year, this is including marching man, was $500. And we got all the stuff that we got. This guy here went to somewhere, I, I forget where he went. He had to pay a marching man fee, a classical fee. He was required to take lessons out of his pocket and a jazz band fee. So. And the whole, this goes into, this just came to my head. This is creating the elitism. This is creating the divide. Mm -hmm. Like we're all public. These are public schools people go to. There is plenty of fundraising you can do. Like I was, Anthony was counting coins in front of us one night of wow. like his fundraising. There's grants people can apply for. There's other ways than taking money out of students' pockets for an activity that they could enjoy and keep through the rest of their life. And that's another part of this like culture of band, I think that people, like I looked over it because I was like, oh, I only have to pay $300 or $500. But people who have to pay thousands of dollars to participate in band. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been able to do it. I don't think I, I could have convinced my parents to would pay, pay not a for you to play it. Get now, out of here. Now you've alienated all of us because we would have never been in band. If I would have brought a paper that said, your child needs over a thousand dollars to participate in band. My father and my mother would have looked at me and said, "You were not doing this." They would have yeah. said, "Oh hell no, get 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 out of my." You know, yes, there definitely would have been some words like no the audacity, <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly, my word. Yeah, and so that's what I mean about who who have we been excluding? Mm -hmm. and who have I been excluding my whole career? Um, because band instruments are expensive, mm -hmm. right? right? And and you say public school, Michael, as if the state is, it, <laughs> the state is, you know, actually funding the school. 
new who, right? I mean, at a certain point, when are we going to stop calling UGA a state school? Um, at a certain, mm. you know, there's just so little money coming in. And then so instead of doing all the things you're talking about, right, fundraising, um, uh, donor relations, all of this stuff, we're, mm. we're going to gouge students. That's, yeah. that's how higher ed's going to die, right? Mm. <clears throat> and um, yeah, there's, uh, boy, we, I could talk all day on this. Seriously. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's another recent crisis I'm having about my entire career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, wow. And it's not like band doesn't matter and there's not a lot of awesome things happening in orchestra and choir and all that sort of stuff. It's just like, um, what else, you mm -hmm. know, what else and who else? Every, everybody has the right to make music, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Everybody has the right to make music in groups um except the way we've set it up <laughs> everyone except for the people who can't pay for it right or 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 we aren't doing music that speaks to them correct, Ooh. correct. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Which, it's but i know we're so far out of time but i was listening to i was doing research on you and i heard uh you say um the first time that you programmed a black composer was way after you taught high school and I think you said it might have been at Cornell or later and I thought to myself when uh, oh it was your interview um, um, at UGA and um, the interview he said I didn't perform a, a piece by a black art a black composer until UGA last year and then if it wasn't for me being in choir and performing spirituals, which I can go on a whole mm -hmm. lot about <laughs> spirituals. And that, because that brings me to my next question really is when you program these uh, uh, black composer pieces or by PLC pieces, can you talk about the necessary research you need to do before actually playing this piece? Because I, I'm a choir kid, we do spirituals, but I've been on songs where they're like, oh, this is just a showstopper. Spirituals? Are they work songs, secret code songs? Are they just for praise and worship? What? Yeah. There's so much research to be done that nobody takes the the necessary time to do. So before you go, can you please just talk about that little part of just doing the necessary work before you go play the showstopper piece? <laughs> showstopper. Yeah, I I will put to you that I don't think um, a lot of conductors research the showstopper or um, music by black composers to the same degree as the other more, shall we say, serious works on the, compo on the program or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I was thinking back to that interview I had with Melvin and I did, I, I programmed a lot of Quincy Hilliard actually when I was in high school. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't do my research on Quincy mm -hmm. Hilliard, you know. I, I, you know, I didn't know how to do score study that well when I was, when I taught high school anyway. That's what I learned at University of Victoria. But yeah, the context of of who a composer is, how what they're I mean, just give them the same due as as Maslanka and 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 everybody else you're programming, right? Find out who their teachers were, who their influences were, who they're teaching, uh, if they're teaching. Um, how long they've been composing, what else have they been writing, uh, you know, what is the context of the piece? Um, you know, I, I think we should stop asking our black composers to write the black piece, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, oh my God. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this Omar talks about this, right? He didn't want to write of our new day begun. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm so glad he did. Right. Um, but uh, that gets difficult too because well do you, you you ask you ask your white you ask your white composers to do that well then they you know they don't like no so yeah. you know but we still keep asking our black composers to write the Black Lives Matter pieces mm -hmm. and uh, okay well, let's just ask them to write a piece <laughs> that they want to write you know um, yeah so i mean you've answered your own question anthony you've got to do the work you've got to do equal work maybe you've got to do more work mm -hmm. um, because of the experiences that are far uh 
worse than yours and more complicated and and fraught with all kinds of cultural yes. uh, weirdness than 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 your experience so yeah i hear you and i think that that's extremely important I mean, Omar's hit the band world like a freight train, right? I mean, I, it, yeah. and, and uh, you know, we conductors are going, oh, there's not been this kind of music before. And, you know, because <laughs> we haven't asked for it. We haven't allowed it. We haven't welcomed it. We haven't, mm -hmm. we haven't given that permission. We, you know, all the, everything, yeah. you know, and now, and, and Omar is just writing what Omar writes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we're all like, you know, all over it. Yeah. It's interest. It's very interesting, right? The, yeah. But what do we know about Omar, right? Mm -hmm. Who are Omar's teachers? What's Omar's life like? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you got to do the work. You've got to do the research and score study. You got to pick up the phone if possible, right? Absolutely. Well, I think we have a little game for you before you leave and before we end the podcast. So Lauren is gonna just ask a couple questions for you. <laughs> yeah, so this game is called, this is one of our favorite games called Lightning Round Favorites. And so the idea of this game is to uh, try to say your answer. Ice cream. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like within, okay. within five seconds, but some of them are a little, not as easy to you know think about. So it's okay if they come over five seconds, it's completely fine, but you know. <laughs> No, no pressure. So the first one is, um, who is your favorite composer, current or just in general? I Okay, this is truthful. I really don't have a favorite composer. I really don't. I don't, I don't, I mean, if I had to pick right now, I think my favorite composer is Kevin Day. Uh, and I'm saying that because, because I'm with him a lot. And I think he's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful soul. Yeah. Um, and I think that his music is just so <laughs> badass. Yeah. And and um, and rich and mm -hmm. fun, mm -hmm. depending on the piece, and real and and vulnerable. Uh, you know. And I just got finished studying a piece, Shimmering Sunshine. Like it's right here. So, so I, I mean, but I, th I think, I mean, if you had to nail me down, I would say Kevin, just because I just love him. I love him as a person. We love, I love, we love Kevin too. He was yeah. just on here about two weeks, two weeks ago, I think for the, yeah, the Black History Month, Black Composers panel. That was, yeah, that was, he's such a sweet, genuine person. Um, so that amazing answer. We love it. <laughs> so uh, favorite conductor who you've worked with? I really like, I really, <laughs> this, you have no idea how complicated this question is. We do this thing, we do these things on purpose sometimes. <laughs> when I was in Costa Rica and we were doing the service learning and performance tours and I, I gave some conducting workshops there with the Cornell Wind Ensemble. And one of the conductors I worked with or we worked with there when you say favorite, I'm I must I'm not going to assume that it means the one I admire the most or the one I have learned from the most or the one I think you know like the most famous or whatever. I mean, yeah, Bob Reynolds is probably. I mean, I love him as a friend, and I think he's a fabulous musician and a wonderful conductor. Mm -hmm. But there was an experience I had in Costa Rica with a young conductor that was so, and this, this was a selfish experience because I felt her so open, so willing to take risks on the podium, so vulnerable, um, so real. So many people get on the podium and there's some other version of themselves. And she wasn't, she just, she was just her and working with her was, she was just so open to try new things. And I think that I, that if I had to pick a favorite conductor, it was her because she taught me a lot and she was so open and vulnerable and real. Nice, yeah. Um, what, what's one of your most favorite pieces to conduct? 
Well, we've talked about Of Our New Day Begun, and it's weird to pick that as, as a favorite because of the nature of that piece, but I, and the, and the reason it had to be written, um, <clears throat> but I've done it now, I don't know how many times, with, with honor bands and at Georgia, and I, I think it's favorites, I'm going to say most compelling and impactful piece, because I see how the musicians are changed by it. I mean, you could argue that we're changed by every piece of music we perform, but this is, this is different. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's an education, it's a journey, it's pain, it's, it's resilience, it's forgiveness, it's, it's everything uh, in a musical way. When, when, when the stomping and the singing happens, it, I mean, and you, you're conducting and the tears are flowing from everybody, including the audience. I mean, that's, isn't that why we do it? Is, is, is that impact? Um, yeah, I, it's just, unfortunately, the piece had to be written. Um, and selections from the whiz. <laughs> That's fine, I mean, that's, I think that that's just a gem. Uh, Charlie Smalls, uh, you know, that's just some real great music. And I love, I, you know, I don't conduct it, I just let it happen, but uh, that's another piece that, you know, you do in front of an audience and they're just clapping and singing and dancing. It is just like, yeah, it's a different kind of impact, but it's, it's a, I love that piece. Awesome. Okay, so now the lighter side, um, <laughs> who's a pop artist you favor or you're enjoying currently or in general? Uh, Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell, okay, okay. Right. I mean, she's, so she saved my life many times. Wow. Check her out. Nick Drake. <laughs> um, if you drink coffee or if you don't drink coffee, tea, what's your like go-to coffee order, tea order, beverage order? Soy cappuccino or lemon green tea. Soy cappuccino. You know, uh, uh, Starbucks is doing their oat milk drinks now. They're amazing. They're yeah. so good. Yeah, I, I, I don't uh, do dairy anymore. And uh, so that's very good to hear. Starbucks kind of pisses me off. But I know, I know. Yeah, it's like a I, relationship. Yeah, it's, yeah. We have a, a, a local chain, Jittery Joe's, here that I try to go to if I'm going to go spend a lot of money on coffee. But, Jittery uh, Joe's. No, Jittery Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> um what's a favorite show of yours uh, to binge or documentaries wait what west wing west wing the west wing you don't know you may i mean it's old now it's like 10 to more than 10 years old uh but but it's uh i think i think i binged the all 10 seasons three times uh it's just a great script uh, it's, it's good it's, it's the yeah it's the promise of what america could be what american leadership could be uh it's you know 12 years later whatever it's got some problems but uh that's that's you know it's a great it's just just great a great script and great acting um what did we watch the other night that was cool behind her eyes hmm. um ooh, i'm not gonna tell you but it's a surprise ending it's like a one of these limited series. Like I think there's six episodes, so it's just. One oh, I long, love limited series. Yeah, one long honking movie, but you get to the end and go, "Did not see that coming." It's a you know, it's a bit like Sixth Sense. <gasps> mm. <laughs> yeah, and so you're gonna get to the end and go, "Now I can't believe it." <laughs> um, what's a a piece of yours, like a chamber ensemble piece that you enjoy conducting? Um, dancing to an orange drummer. I didn't actually conduct it. I had one of my grad students do it by, um, Vanessa Lamb. That's a very cool piece, kind of minimal, minimalist. It's about immigration. Um, I quite love that. Um, we're, uh, we just did Viet Quang's Extra Fancy. Um, oh. that is super fun to conduct. And we just laid it down actually in a recording and, um, it's funny, we did, we did two pieces. We did Jim Stevenson's Fanfare for Democracy. And I thought that that would go really easily. 
and it didn't. And then Viet Quang's extra fancy, which is extra hard, and two takes. It was there. Wow. So that was that's part of why I like I really liked it because it was just, just such a it's so it's so fun. Um, and the other thing about it is that the students classically trained oboists and bassoonists, by the way, are asked to do some pretty bizarre things with their instrument, um, like uh, multiphonics and, you know, all that stuff. And, and so they, at first they're like, I don't, I don't like this. And at the end they're like, thank you so much for this experience. So that's, that's part of why I was like, yeah, it's, it's a awesome, great piece. I think Via Kuang is superstar. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about, you know, the, that conductor that you worked with that she, uh, she really inspired you. Would you consider that to be your, one of your favorite conducting experiences or do you have other like conducting experiences you look back on and you're like, this shaped me in a lot of ways. Places We Can No Longer Go by John Mackey. Um, we, we did that, I guess, two years ago uh, with Lindsay Kesselman. And it was about, I think that this is John's uh, mas masterpiece. I have a problem with that word, but I think that it was a it was a piece that he wrote that was pure artistic generosity, mm -hmm. and um, that's another piece where there were lots of lots of tears. I mean, that piece is a, a unbelievable, and the reason it was I it was a kind of a, one of those conducting moments is because we nailed it. Uh, so there was that, like it went well, uh, working with Lindsay Kesselman as an artist is, is, I can't recommend it enough. She's just brilliant. Uh, and it was one of those experiences where the audience didn't clap right away. It was just sort of this, <gasps> and then that slow clap. And then finally, just, you know, people on their feet. So that, that felt good, but it's just an amazing piece. Well, I want to listen to that now, seriously. Okay, and then last question. What's the first place you want to travel when, like, not for work or for anything else other than pleasure once COVID is more under control? Um, I saw a picture of the Maldives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, where they have, it's the, first of all, the color of the ocean is, like, indescribable, and they have these huts, right? Yeah. And, and I went, okay, all right. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, like that. Just a week. It's fine. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so, so, so much for having this talk with us. And it's it's been such a pleasure just to hear from you and your perspectives and your journey to be where you are and all the amazing amazing things that you're still doing out there. Um, so thank you so much. And we hope that you had fun talking to us as well. Totally. I, 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 what a riot. I mean, this is, I've been doing a few of these. This is, this has been so fun. So fun. And, and you three are, what can I say? You, you, you're the future. You're the present. Uh, you're, you're just beautiful. So keep it up. I love what you're doing. And it's so, so important, not just to the three of you, but to so many others. And I feel blessed to have been here. Thank you so much. Uh, you're you're an inspiration to all of us, and we're excited to see everything else that we know you're gonna do. And yeah, so we hope you, everyone enjoyed this uh, episode. Remember to like, subscribe, comment below, follow us on all of our other socials, and let us know how you felt about the episode. Uh, some things were said for sure. Yeah. <laughs> some things were said. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see you next week, guys. Be safe. Uh... Bye. Thank you for being a part of our conversation. You can learn more and reach out to us at relativepitchpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to our listening platforms and follow us on our social media. See you next time.